Hello, guys. If you're there, uh, go ahead and sign in for the lab. I'm going to pick up a couple of things from the lab, and hopefully we can do something here. I haven't tried this. Tried it on my uh, laptop and hit a dead end. So hang tight for just a second. Oh, Tom. I don't know, you got key, so I reckon you can get on. Drop off your proctor exam, something like that. That's the only Hello, folks. Glad you're here. I hope this is going to work. Tried it in the lab and it didn't work on my laptop. So we'll just have to see what we can do. We'll give him a few more minutes to get there. There's another one, Daisha.
Katie, did you come to the lecture at 8 o'clock? Katie, did you come to the lecture at 8 o'clock? Okay, good. Well, I missed you, I think. Okay, thank you. I have no idea how this is going to work, but if I remember correctly, you guys have already done your, you did your blood plates, and so you had to look at these organisms. Can you look at this? The right focal length there. Can you tell <laughs> if you can read through the auger? You can do it. I'll turn it so you, maybe you can read through the auger. See, it's wiping out the blood. So what kind of hemolysis is this? Anybody, shoot, shoot me a note. What kind of hemolysis? Read you here, Marcus. That's good. Great. Okay. Now, it's beta hemolytic. Now, let me ask you this. As you look at this, suppose I were to ask you a question like, is this organism coagulase positive? And your response would be, Plastic makes a shine, doesn't it? So would this organism be coagulase positive or coagulase negative? Okay, so you got the idea. Well, how about catalase positive? Is it catalase positive or catalase negative? That's some nice beta hemolysis in there. It came right out of my nair. You see, I carry a pretty good population. Nobody wants to rub noses with me. 
but my brave wife. Let's take a look at this one. Trying to find the right focal length. What type of hemolysis do you see there? Good. You get any idea there? So would this organism be catalase positive? Mm, that doesn't really help anything, does it? Yeah, it's too much of a glare. So it's catalase positive. What about coagulase? Look at those side by side. This is the one you said was beta. You can see the clearing of the blood over here. All you see is the shadow of the colony. So that would be um, gamma hemolysis and coagulase negative and catalase positive. They would look the same under the microscope. But you got two tests that would uh, differentiate them. Remember, that was our whole purpose, was to differentiate gram-positive cocci. It looks so much alike under the microscope. That's good, Jamisha. <laughs> I get it. If we can have a test on this somehow, then I'll make sure those names are not there, but... But you see, there's no no change in the blood right there, whereas here you can see the cleared areas. Of course, it'll be a little easier when you have a real one there. Let's see how these turn out. Can this one over here, does this one show enough green around the colonies there? Can you see green versus colorless? Or I should say um, beta hemolysis around there. See how that's cleared real well? This one you see green around the little colonies. This one would be called, Amanda says this would be called alpha. What is the hemolysis over here where my finger's moving? That's correct. 
correct. This would be beta over here. This is the one that causes strep throat. I'm going to try to do a strep test and let you see how it is done in the office at a, at a physician's um, workplace. So imagine you're going to have to look at plates like this. Hopefully we can figure out how to do that and you can, uh, you can have a test on it in terms of a lab test. So any question about these four plates? Now, we're good, for a few minutes, we're going to look at three differential medias that are used to differentiate uh, gram-negative rods. Okay, let's see. Diasia, you said the green shadow is an indicator of alpha hemolysis. Yes, that's correct. You'll see a little bit of a zone around those little colonies. Those are tiny little colonies, but they do show a green zone around them. Now, the colony is not green. The colony is basically colorless, but the hemolysis, which is partial, is alpha hemolysis, and it turns the blood green. Okay? So, I hold this up to you. Do you remember that? What kind of auger is that? That's correct, Shavia. It's good, Diasia. Yep, that's right. Citrate auger. When we when we put an organism, whew, when we put an organism um, on this, what? will be revealed to us about the organism. We know it's a gram-negative rod, but what will be revealed about the organism? Amanda, you're right. It's a Simmons citrate auger. That's correct. Anybody got an idea of what it's going to reveal to us about the organism? What's it going to tell it tell us about the organism? Got two cameras here. That's why my head goes up. Looks at a higher camera, comes back, looks at a lower camera. Any ideas? Okay, Jamisha. Okay, that's right, Amanda. In our case, it's going to tell you that it means it's Escherichia. And Jamisha, if it can metabolize, what you need to do is keep on with that thought and say if it can metabolize citrate. In other words, can it use it for energy? If it can use it for energy, that's right, Shavia. It has the enzyme to break down citrate. That's correct. So in this case, this organism on here does not have the enzyme. So we say it is citrate negative. Here's the other one. So this particular change, in this, this auger, Used to look just like this one. I 
to 24 hours, turn this color. That's right. And you're on the you're on the right road. Diasia, you would be right. It could be it could be two different organisms. What two different organisms would turn citrate auger blue? Jacqueline, you're correct. Pseudomonas is one of them. What's the other one? That's right, Eugene. Enterobacter. So if we, in your case, want to differentiate three gram-negative rods, we can differentiate one from the other two, this would be Escherichia because it's citrate negative. This one is citrate positive. But you can't tell Enterobacter from Pseudomonas on this auger. You can tell Enterobacter or Pseudomonas from Escherichia in the green, but you can't tell Enterobacter or, or Pseudomonas from each other because they both can utilize citrate as a carbon source. Am I going too fast for you? To make sure you're correct. Comfortable with these two uh, presentations of citrate auger? No questions about it? Differential media. Citrate auger. Some people call it cinnamon citrate, and that's fine. So if we can't tell Pseudomonas from Enterobacter on citrate, we have to go to a different auger. That's a pretty good focal length, isn't it? Hope I don't spill this all over my hands and desk. Couldn't get my laptop to work down there in the in the uh, the lab. So you can see how colorless Pseudomonas is on McConkie auger. This is McConkie auger, and here's Enterobacter. They look the same under the microscope, but you put them on McConkie auger, and you can differentiate them. And, of course, this one over here is Escherichia. They all look pretty much the same under the microscope. Now, what activity are we looking for when we put an organism on McConkie auger? What characteristic? Metabolically characteristic. What are we looking for? Eugene, you're correct. 
We're looking for lactose fermentation. So these two, since they produce a color change, indicate that they can ferment the sugar lactose. That's right, lactose fermentation. So Pseudomonas, as you see, is basically colorless compared to these two. Some of you may have a sharper eye for color, but they would call in microbiology, they would say Pseudomonas is colorless compared to Enterobacter and compared to Escherichia. Comfortable with that. Okay. Let's see how this one turns out. Not quite as good, is it? You had this in your... Before you, you can turn it a little bit. I don't know if this will help or not. Mm, not very good. It's much better with just the eye. Pseudomonas is in the center. This is um, Enterobacter and this darker one over here. It's really um, got a dark green on it. That's Escherichia. So what are we expecting to determine about a, a gram-negative rod when we put it on EMB? What are we looking for? What activity are we looking for? That's correct. It does. You're right, Amanda. <clears throat> Again, you're looking for lactose fermentation. So since it's lactose fermentation, you get a strong color, that green, metallic green indicates that's Escherichia. Pseudomonas, again, is pretty much colorless on here. No fermentation. Enterobacter is a moderate fermenter. Comfortable with that? Okay, I'm going to try something here now, unless you have a question. Got my little box here to put stuff away. Don't need a flame. Just got a swab here. Two of them. Got the instructions how to carry out this test. 
Now, those of you who are mothers, you probably have <clears throat> taken your child to the doctor, and they stick a swab down the child's throat and mix it with some substances that are going to help you identify the antigen on the group A strep. That's what we're looking for is the antigen that Rebecca Lansfield discovered on the cell wall of Streptococcus pyogenes. So here are a couple of substances that we have to use. One is called sodium nitride. The other one's called phosphoric acid. Now you don't have to know that. Just trying to show you how they determine if, the, if your child has strep throat. Now in step one, it says take this bottle and drop in four drops into this container. I'm going to do the same thing over here because I want to use a different organism. Okay, four drops there. And then I'm going to put in four drops of phosphoric acid. I'm doing it down here. And it says to shake it up. Kind of gets to be like a little pink color, as you can see. So it says... Put the swab into the tube. All right, so I'm going to take a swab. Here's the swab. I'm going to take a little bit of the streptococcus here. Rotate the swab vigorously as I'm doing. Let it stand for one to two minutes. I'll take another swab. And I'm going to get some of this. And put it down in there and swab it around real well. Let's see what happens here. This is a staphylococcus, so I uh, didn't think we would get a response to it. It says, let it stand for one to two minutes. Somebody's knocking at my door. Excuse me just a moment. Okay. We lock ourselves out of our offices sometimes, so help each other out. About another minute and we'll be done. Okay, it says to squeeze this 
cotton swab. So we have some liquid down in the bottom. So we'll place that in the container. So we don't have any problems with that. We'll squeeze this one. Now we take this stick, this little stick. Come on, show up on the camera. Come on. There we go. That's a rough work on the camera. Okay, we stick it down in there. We do the same thing with the other one. Okay, you place it in there. You have to read the results in five minutes. So we let that sit. Anybody need to go to the bathroom or anything like that? Get a cup of coffee or something? Okay, so about 10.43, we ought to be able to read that. And I'll show you what we're looking for. I'm going to try something here. I don't know if it's going to work. I'm going to plug this flash drive in. You guys see on the screen where it says virus scan 1%? Somebody reply to me. box that says virus scan. Eugene, no, we have not talked about coronaviruses. We sure haven't. They're in that group with SARS, but we have really not talked about them. Anybody see a, a scan on there? You don't see a box? Okay, well... It looks like I'm going to be dead in the water in about four minutes. Hmm. Okay, so it's not coming through. I was—I don't know if it would or not. It's the first time I've ever done it. Uh, what I want to want to go over with you is some uh, parasites. I might be able to do something uh, here, but I think you can look it up. We'll hang in here for just a few more minutes for our solution here.
I think what I can do, Diasia, uh, is perhaps download or attach a PowerPoint to an email to you guys, and then you can open it up and look at the organisms that I want you to look at. So I think that'll work for you, Diasia. Eugene, I don't. I was hoping that we would see this uh, virus scan here that for my flash drive that I've got some PowerPoints on. So, uh, but that's not going to work like that. Kind of thought it might not, since it's not really on the camera. Okay, we're going to try this here. It's coming up pretty good. We got a positive and we got a negative. Okay. Now, in my, I'll turn this around. Now, if you look closely, let's see if I can get it in good focus for you. If you look in my left hand, where my head's going, you see a purple line across the top. You see the same purple line in my right hand. But if you look closely on the one on my left, there is another band down below it, but it's very light. I don't know how close I can get. To let you see that. that be, see that little band down there at the bottom of the one on the left? When you see that second band right there, I'm going to stick my finger in it, that tells you that kid's got a strep throat infection. Over here on the right, you see the band at top, but you don't see the band at the bottom. That's a negative. So this is a positive. So within about 10 minutes, that's why you can uh, determine if your child has a strep throat. Let me ask you something. Have we talked about Rebecca Lansfield before? Thanks, Eugene. I'm new to this stuff, so, <clears throat> but I'm going to have to learn how to do it. Teach an old dog new tricks. So everybody saw the uh, little purple line? You had two up top, and then you had one over here on the bottom. I think it was on the left-hand one. Very light, but that tells you that you have a streptococcus pyogenes growing in your throat. Now, <clears throat> Eugene, you don't think we've talked about Rebecca Lansfield yet? Okay. Let's do this. Let's take some notes. So get a piece of paper and if you don't have one. They're offering to us this thing called WebEx or something like that. I think it's more like a conference call where you can actually talk to me and I can talk to you. It uh, makes it a little easier than having to read the responses and takes the burden off of you having to type an answer. Well, everybody ready to take some notes on Rebecca Lansfield? Okay, so Rebecca Lancefield, it's L-A-N-C-E-L-A-N-C-E-F-I-E-L-D. -E -E 
Rebecca Lancefield. She had a PhD in bacteriology and decided to spend her life studying the streptococci. And she soon found that she, uh, although there were all gram-positive cocci in chains and pairs, she found that they had different proteins on their cell wall. So she began to categorize them, put them in groups, according to their surface antigens. And she named those, those groups, rather, she named those groups uh, after letters of the alphabet. So when you get into your uh, nursing career, PA career, or whatever the um, Lord's called you to work in, um, you will hear about group A in infections, group A strep infections. You'll hear about group B and so forth. When you hear group A and group B, that means they have different antigens on their surface on their cell wall. They could look just alike under the microscope. They probably do. They're gram-positive cocci and clusters and not clusters, excuse me, chains and in pairs. So you can't tell them apart by looking at them just under the microscope, just like we had the gram-negative um, rods. You can't tell them apart. So she found out that group A had a particular protein on its cell wall called that group A. The group B has a different protein on its cell wall. We would call it a different antigen. Group A is the one that causes the strep throat. Group B usually doesn't do that. Group B is typically found in the birth canal of a female. That's what they do when they uh, check you uh, before you come give birth. They want to know if you are group B strep positive. Group B uh, strep can attack the newborn. It can give it meningitis. We'll mention that a little bit later as we get into the nervous system, but it can also cause a, a respiratory tract infection. So if a lady is group B a strep positive, when they come, she comes to give birth, then they will um, either give her an injection or they'll get a, some sort of an infusion of an antibiotic that will kill the group B strep so that as the child passes through the birth canal, uh, the child also ha will have absorbed or uh, received some of the antibiotic into its bloodstream and therefore it has dropped the birth uh, death rate uh, from 15,000 or so a year uh, to very little. You don't usually hear too much about it. All because of knowing that the mother carries that. Doesn't bother the mother at all, but it will sometimes attack the newborn. So when you hear about group A strep infection, you start thinking about a throat infection, although it could be some other place. Um, the necrotizing fasciitis was caused by group A strep that we talked about back in the, the virally converted strep uh, back in chapter 19. Does anybody have a question? I keep jumping over to this computer because I can read it more easily than this surface.
Hard to see that little band on the camera, but it's there, the second um, band toward the bottom. Heavy purple band at top, and light pant band in the bottom, and that's your group A. Put that in the sharps container. Okay. <clears throat> um, we're going to talk about, for a few minutes here, we're going to talk about four blood parasites. The first one is going to have the genus called Plasmodium. Now, if you have your lab book, just look in your lab book and you should see I think it's exercise 10, I believe. Um, yeah, I think it's 10. Everybody okay with that? It is it is uh, exercise 10. So locate that in your lab book. Hope I'm not going too fast. I've never done this before. so uh, But you guys are not complaining, so either you're really nice or <laughs> don't want to slow the time down or whatever. Anybody not ready to take some notes on these parasites? Okay, so here we go. So the first parasite that I want you to know about is you look at your lab book, you see the word, you see the genus Plasmodium. P-L-A-S-M-O-D-I-U-M. It is a sporozoan. You remember the four groups of protozoa? The ciliata, the mastigopher, and so forth. Well, this one happens to be a sporozoan, which means it doesn't have any means of movement. And it causes the disease known as malaria. How do you normally get malaria? How do you pick that up? That's correct. Mosquitoes. And it's a particular mosquito, a specific mosquito. That's right. You got it, you ladies got it right. You too, Eugene. <clears throat> so the genus of that mosquito is called Anopheles. Anopheles. A N O P H E L E S A N O P H E L E S And we have Anopheles mosquitoes in South Carolina So it is possible to pick it up. So if you like to go out in the woods, uh, deer hunting or whatever, bird hunting, or uh, enjoy just hiking through the woods, just be mindful of that. Put on some spray, have all the right kind of clothing or whatever. Um, 
was a few years ago that uh, a colleague here at school and I were talking about malaria. And we decided to call a physician. And he was gracious enough to uh, answer our call. And we told him we were talking about malaria is present in South Carolina. And he said in his reply, he said, it's interesting that you called me today. He said, yesterday I treated a one-year-old for malaria in Kershaw County. So the parasite is there. We typically have changed our lifestyle. We're no longer uh, hunters looking for deer and bear and whatever to eat. You know, we hunt in, in places like Food Lion and Harris Teeter. So uh, it's here. And you think think about if you, if you ever notice when you go to the beach, you notice how when you go out 76 towards uh, Marion, that highway drops and you're in the floodplain of the PD River. There's a lot of water in South Carolina. And of course, that's where if it's stagnant to a degree, then that's where these mosquitoes can breed. But anyway, um, that's how it's picked up. Now, there's a little bit of the life cycle I want you to know about. So, the mosquito must bite you. And when it bites you, it injects an anticoagulant. An anticoagulant. That's A N T I C O A G U L A N T. And of course, the anticoagulant is to keep the, the blood from uh, clotting in the, pro, they would call it a proboscis. It's like their needle that they stick you with. So when that anti anticoagulant is injected, also injected is the sporozoite. S-P-O-R-O-Z-O-I-T-E. It injects the sporozoite. Now that is a is simply a developmental stage of the plasmodium. So that sporozoite eventually, by the bloodstream, gets into the liver. Once it gets into the liver, it matures into a merozoite. Merozoite. M E R O Z O I T E. Now the merozoite leaves the liver. and enters the bloodstream. Once it's in the bloodstream, it will penetrate the red blood cells. A merozoite will penetrate the red blood cells.
Once it gets inside the red blood cell, it does two things that I want you to know. Number one, it eats hemoglobin. And the second thing it does is it multiplies. With the multiplication, it eventually bursts the red blood cell. And those parasites that come out of that burst cell, that fragmented cell, each one will enter a, a new uninfected red blood cell and start that process again. Eat the hemoglobin, multiply, burst the cell. So for the first um, few weeks, months maybe, you're not aware very much of that occurring. But eventually the population of the parasite really increases through this process. So you reach a point where um, when the parasites cause the blood cells to rupture, they, the rupturing of the red blood cells, the hemolysis, if you want to use that word, that's good, of the red blood cells, occurs over about a 10-hour period. That 10 hour period is called a malarial crisis. Now, depending upon the species, and there are a number of species, and you don't have to know them all, you just want to know the genus, but there's six or eight species they can have different time periods in terms of the, the time between malarial crises. Some might have a malarial crisis every 72 hours. Another one might have it every two months. You don't have, you just want to know generally that the, according to the species, the crisis occurrence can vary in terms of how often you have a crisis each year or sometimes each month. So for about 10 hours, this crisis occurs and the patient experiences headache, Nausea and vomiting. They have uh, delusions or hallucinations.
And they also have shivering. Some of you may have shivered um, with some sort of infection that you've had in life. And some of you may not have been able to speak well because you couldn't control your lips. Some of you have probably been so cold that uh, you put all these blankets on you and you're still cold. So for 10 hours, this victim, this patient, is, is shivering. And of course, shivering is muscle contractions, um, basically involuntary. You're using up a lot of ATP. So when you are finished with that episode, that crisis, you are exhausted. You have spent so much energy shivering, attempting to raise the, the temperature. So when you're having one of those malarial crisis, crises, um, you're not going to be driving down the road. Oh, I wish I felt a little better or whatever. Uh, can be pretty tough on you. Now, if you think about this for just a minute, here come these periods of, of a crisis and all these red blood cells are rupturing. It creates a big problem. Now go back to your anatomy for just a minute. Shoot me an answer with your, um, your keyboard. What two organs in the body are involved with recycling old red blood cells? You're halfway there, Eugene. The kidney really doesn't do anything about that. It's not the kidney. The spleen is involved. Much larger organ. The liver, that's right, Dorothy. Or destiny, excuse me. That's right. So the liver and the spleen are the ones where they're designed four old red blood cells to pass through the sinusoids and they break up because when they get reach about 120 days old, they become fragile, they break up, and then the spleen and the liver recycle things. Some of the bile that we produce uh, comes from the recycling of red blood cells. You and I are recycling those red blood cells at this moment. And of course, our bone marrow is turning out new ones. So it's a homeostatic mechanism, isn't it, that you learned about back in uh, uh, anatomy. So we're used to recycling red blood cells, but when this crisis comes, it overwhelms the liver and the spleen. They can't keep up with it, but they try to keep up with it. And the way they try to keep up with it is they enlarge. Now, this is in untreated malaria. And there are places around the world where people simply suffer with it. Several million people a year die from malaria. They call the enlargement of the spleen and the liver, they call it hepatomegaly and splenomegaly. And you know megaly means big. Most of us would like to have megabucks in uh, 
an account somewhere. So those are, those are organs in large in an attempt to handle the situation. Now they don't handle it perfectly. So some of the waste products back up into our bloodstream the pigments from hemoglobin and so forth, and we turn yellow. And what do they call that when our, the cornea, not the cornea, the sclera of our eyes and the, our skin and so forth turn yellow? What do they call that? Sure, Amanda. Uh, you're talking about splenomegaly, S-P-L-E-N-O, and then megaly, M-E-G-A-L-Y, and then take hepato, H-E-P-A-T-O, and then add megaly to it. That's right, Eugene. They, in the Asia, they, uh, Diasia, they turn yellow, and that's called jaundice. So don't go out there and talk about yellow jaundice because that's like saying you're yellow, yellow. <laughs> that's right, Brittany, the liver and the spleen. That's two organs that enlarge trying to help us with this uh, condition. Now imagine all those red blood cells rupturing ever so often. Pretty soon you're going to develop anemia. Because your bone marrow can't keep up with the destruction of the red blood cells by the parasite. That's right, Katie. Don't just put an N in there, though. Now, Eugene, you mentioned the kidney, and the kidney is not involved in terms of recycling red blood cells or anything like that. But um, what happens if you go back into um, what we talked about in lecture in terms of uh, immune complexes? Remember, that's where an antibody attaches to a, um, an antigen. So we produce immune complexes uh, by making antibodies that attack some of the breakdown products of the parasite. And those lodge the kidney and lead to renal failure. You don't want to catch malaria. You want to make sure if you're going to go out in the woods or wherever, you know, have some repellent on or the right kind of clothing so the mosquitoes cannot get you. I remember when Hurricane Matthew came through and a friend of mine and, uh, and I went out into the woods over around Black Creek. We were going to, on his property, we were going to hunt some deer. And got out of that car and we were just surrounded by mosquitoes. As make a great horror show. Okay. 
Now, I was wondering what those marks meant. <laughs> but anyway, uh, everybody okay with malaria now? All right, as you look in your lab book, uh, there's uh, another parasite we want to look at called Leishmania, L-E-I-S-H-M-A-N-I-A. -I -I Leishmania is the, the genus of a mastogopherin. Remember that term? So that means it's got a flagellum. Now, sporo the sporozoans, the plasmonium, they don't have anything like that. No cilia, no flagella. But this guy's got a flagellum. And it causes a condition called leishmaniasis. So if you take leishmania, and add SIS to the end of it. SIS to the end of Leishmania, Leishmania. Then you have the condition called Leishmaniasis. You simply shift your emphasis in the word. Instead of saying Leishmaniasis, you say Leishmaniasis. Now, the vector that brings this to you is called phlebotomus. P-H-L-E-B-O-T-O-M-U-S. Phlebotomus. And the reason I bring this up is because you may run into some people who have this condition. This parasite, Leishmania, plus the vector, Phlebotomus, <coughs> excuse me, are endemic to the Middle East. So our soldiers have run into this parasite. So when that bug bites you and injects the leishmania into your tissues, I see your question there, Eugene. It's P-H-L-E-B-O-T-O-M-U-S. Last three letters are M-U-S. The bottom mist is what the guys and girls are in the hospital to draw your blood. But the bottom must is the genus of that fly that likes to bite you over there and give you this parasite. You can either get what they call cutaneous, cutaneous leishmaniasis, and that's going to leave disfiguring uh, marks on your skin, or you can have visceral leishmaniasis. Now, you don't die from cutaneous leishmaniasis, but you've got some disfiguration somewhere. It might be the back of your hand, might be on your face. 
whatever is exposed. Excuse me. Uh, visceral leash maniasis is um, fatal if you don't treat it. And the treatment is not a walk in the park. It is not a walk in the park. It is, uh, they give you a poison. So if you're running into somebody with leishmaniasis, then you probably are talking to, in, in America, you're probably talking to somebody who's been over in Iraq, Iran, uh, Kuwait. So far, so good. Anybody need me to repeat anything? Your next parasite, called Trypanosoma gambiense. It is a another mastigopheron, like leishmania. It is found in Africa. Causes a condition called African sleeping sickness. And people pick it up by being bitten by a fly. It has the genus Glossina, G-L-O-S-S-I-N-A. common name for that fly is spelled like this. It's T-S-E T-S-E and then you add the word fly to it. Now, most Americans butcher it. They call it a Tsetse fly but it's one of those interesting words from another language where you don't pronounce the T in this case. If you think about uh, a huge wave that comes out of the ocean, as it did in a um, number of years ago over there in Indonesia, um, they call them the tidal wave, but they also call them a tsunami. And how do you spell tsunami? Starts with a T, doesn't it? But they don't ever pronounce the T. So you kind of wonder, why, why do you even write that? But anyway. So we, we call it a setsi fly. I've had some people from Kenya who were in the class. They came over and became nurses or PAs, and they went back to Africa to, to help their people. And so um, the, the vector is called a setsi fly, setsi. Fortunately, we don't have them over here uh, yet. Who knows what might happen, but anyway, um, literally, when they bite you and give you that parasite, then you uh, can develop African sleeping sickness, 
where you sleep anywhere from 18 to 22 hours a day. And they lose control of their um, their bowels. They lose control of their tongue and lips. Eventually, they go into a coma and die. Don't have to, because there is some medicine to treat that parasite. If they can't reach a medical facility, then it's uh, it's death for them. Okay, one more, and then we'll cut it off. Your fourth parasite is called Trypanosoma cruzi, as you see in your lab notebook. Uh, those two look very much alike under the microscope. You do not have to differentiate them for me. You're not going to become a parasitologist, at least not at this point. And this parasite, uh, Trypanosoma cruzi, um, it's sort of like, uh, well, let's just say it's found down in South America. <clears throat> it's found in Central America. And in Mexico. And it can even be found in southern Texas and Louisiana. How do you get this? There is an insect bug, we would call it, called a kissing bug. That is called a kissing bug because they, if they get in your house, and they bite you at night, they tend to come up here where you have some exposed skin. Most of us sleep with a sheet or a blanket over us to some degree. And uh, what's hanging out is usually our face. So they'll come up and bite you, suck your blood. And while they are partaking of your blood, they defecate on your skin. That would be close to the bite site.
Now, one of the reasons I tell you this is because we actually are finding the kissing bug migrating north into America. It has already made uh, some people sick over in Georgia. So it's moving this way, just like the armadillo, just like the fire ants came out of those areas. And this guy's coming too. So uh, you want to make sure your house is pretty tight so these bugs can't get in there. Um, I have a cousin of the kissing bug that um, I found out on the third floor. Not the third floor, but the, the walkway into the building that comes into the third floor. And they're called assassin bugs. And so they have a nice little needle on their head. They can puncture you if you mess with them. Uh, I caught one and mounted it. And so you, we won't be able to see it right now, but you can look it up on the internet. But anyway, this bug's making its way over here, so you want to be aware of that. Now, if someone gets bitten by a kissing bug, and some of you may end up going out of the country to help people in another country. My dentist goes down to Central America and does work for people uh, to try and help their oral health. And uh, there are other doctors and doctors without borders and so forth. And people at McLeod and MUSC will get teams together and they'll go down and help folks. So when they go into those areas, right, it's good to know what's out there that's liable to create a problem for you. So insect repellent is a great way to avoid it, just like with mosquitoes. Uh, some people have slept under a net so the bugs can't get in and bite them. But if you get bitten, there's two things you want to do. There's one thing you don't want to do, and there's another thing you do want to do. The thing you don't want to do is rub the bite. You know how sometimes we massage something, and, oh, you know, it hurts so much and you're trying to to uh, make, make you feel better. If you do that, you rub the feces into the bite. It's in the feces where the parasites locate. Y'all getting tired? I'm getting tired. <laughs> Just a little bit more. So one, you don't want to rub the bite. Second thing, you want to get a washcloth and just wipe away from the bite. Put some antiseptic there. You get the feces out of the way, put some antiseptic on the bite. And hopefully it doesn't come up as this little staph infection or something like that. But if you rub the bite and the, and the bug is defecated on you, then you can put those fe the feces in the bite, and there's your transmission. So you don't rub the bite, and then you wipe away from the bite with a clean cloth and put some antiseptic on it, and you can avoid that problem. You just have to get that mindset so that you <clears throat> don't, do something accidentally. But suppose that that happens to somebody. Then what's going to develop here is a swollen area called a chagoma. C-H-A-G-O-M-A. It's a swollen area that's um, tender. A swollen area that is tender. <clears throat> and eventually uh, heals. And Chagoma is C-H-A-G-O-M-A. It's named after the person who discovered the disease called Chaga. And so the disease itself is called Chagas. 
disease. C-H-A-G-A apostrophe S, Chagas disease. Sometimes I wake it real long and call it Chagasiasis. Like we did Leishmaniasis. So we're about to wrap this up. What I'm going to do is I will I'll try through D2L, see if I can attach a PowerPoint presentation so you can open it up, uh, look at the pictures. You want to be able to identify the parasites, the vector, some of the, the uh, signs and symptoms that show up with that particular um, disease. How can you avoid it? So those are the four blood parasites. Does anyone have a question? Or has everybody gone to sleep? <laughs> Who is Funny Balloon? Is that one of you guys out there? Funny Balloon? Don't want to reveal your hidden identity. Anybody have a question? Well, thanks for hanging in there. I'm going to end this stream. And as far as I know, it's still going to be on the... Uh, on YouTube. Amanda, I think you will be able to watch the video again. Uh, I'm not going to de delete it or dismiss it or anything like that. So as far as I know, it should be on John Pritchett Live. And you can view it again as you need to. Eugene says, yes, Amanda, it will be. You'll be able to see it. Eugene's probably more technologically oriented than I am. I still shoot black powder pistols and rifles. Any other questions? Okay, well, I'm going to end it. And what we'll, what we'll do is we'll pick up Monday morning. Let's see, now he's just got to comment here since we are without your excellence during these times any test hits want to, to drop us uh, uh, a little black powder is good in UG uh, you've already got the third the second test don't you you've already got that keep teaching the closet door as soon as they get this figured out hopefully within the next couple of days We'll see if we can let you get to that third test before um, you forget too much of it. Okay. All right. Well, I'll look forward to seeing you guys. We'll pick up um, in Chapter 19 uh, at 8 o'clock on Monday morning. Okay. Have a good weekend, guys.